Hi, everybody. Thank you for listening in. I think today we're going to be talking about something that's so very important. All of you know how important diet is, at least to me, and I think to you too. But honestly, as important as eating properly is, eating eating right for your needs, we need to sleep. And today, without any doubt, there's a huge sleep deprivation problem going on. I asked for questions on Facebook and I got a lot of responses from people. It was very interesting because most people have trouble falling asleep or staying asleep. So what I have done today is ask my friend Michael Bruce, Dr. Michael Bruce, who's a sleep expert and who is hosting the first sleep summit, at least it's the first one I've ever heard of and one of the most important summits you'll ever want to listen to. I have asked him to come on and talk to us today and give us a little teaser and some great information to help us sleep better. So welcome, Michael. Thank you for being here. Oh, are you kidding me? Donna, thank you. I'm so excited to talk to your group of people. I'm excited to hear their questions. And I I love the fact that you value sleep as much as you do. I know we've had some great conversations about that. And um, I'm just excited to be here. One of the things I teach is about the step-by-step principle and you know, that there's, that's about where you start when you want to heal yourself from something, if you want to have a healthy baby, if you want to age well, whatever your goal is, you have to start somewhere and the step-by-step principle gives us some important clues for, for that, you know, where to start. And, the, and one of the, so it's really four different things you have to be focused on at the same time. And one of those things is to create energy. One is you have to conquer infections in your body. One is you have to correct digestion. And one is you have to cleanse out toxins. But the first and most important one is create energy because you can't digest your food. You can't overcome uh, an infection like candidiasis. You can't cleanse if you don't have energy. But then if you don't sleep, you don't have energy. It literally ruins your entire day. So that's why I think sleep is so absolutely fundamental to wellness which um, I'm sure from all the experts that you've interviewed on the summit that every one of them has provided amazing amount of information. But do you find that most people, um, you know, because this is what we found out from interviewing the Facebook group, is that uh, they either have trouble falling asleep or staying asleep. So can we sort of get into that a little bit? I don't want to go into it too deeply because I really want people to ultimately take the time and sign up for the summit, listen to all the interviews and ultimately save this summit and, you know, purchase it and, um, keep it around forever. Cause what I do, I, I always listen to summits and I buy them and I listen to many, many webinars through some of the organizations I belong to like A4M and IFM. And I'll listen to a lecture two or three or four times. And every time I listen to it, I hear something different. So (laughs) let's get into these really important basic questions, and then sure. you know people can go deeper uh, by listening to the summit. So, absolutely. So first of all, mm-hmm. this is one of the most. These are some of the most prevalent questions that I get asked, um, whether I'm on television or doing a summit or having an interview, what have you. So I am an insomnia specialist, and so for those of you out there who may not know me a little bit, um, I've been a practicing uh, sleep specialist for the last 16 years. And um, I, my specialty is insomnia, and so I deal with people who have a hard time falling asleep and who have a hard time staying asleep. It's actually very, very interesting. It turns out that hard time staying asleep is actually more popular than the difficulty falling asleep, but both are considered to be uh, subtypes of insomnia. So to back up just a little, what is insomnia? Insomnia is the inability to either fall asleep, stay asleep, or wake up too early This happens to you either approximately three times a week or more for approximately three weeks or more. That would be the clinical definition of insomnia. And um, there are many, many, many people out there who have a lot of different research, who have pharmaceutical interventions, who have uh, nutraceutical interventions. There's lots of people out there trying to help those with insomnia, specifically difficulty falling asleep and staying asleep. Um, and the good news is, is that most people need to understand that their what I call their sleeper isn't broken, meaning that switch inside their head um, that eventually slowly turns on when they are lying down and trying to fall asleep. It's rare, very rare, in fact, that it actually isn't working. Um, more, it's that we have um, lifestyles, we have habits, we have 
different things that we might do during the day or even in the evening that could prevent us from either falling asleep or staying asleep. I like to differentiate between the two um, for a couple of different reasons because many of my patients who have a hard time falling asleep, they don't have a hard time staying asleep and vice versa. If you generally have a hard time falling asleep, that's what we call a sleep initiation problem. A couple of things to think about there. Most people don't realize it, but your heart rate actually has to get to a very particular level in order for you to enter into a state of unconsciousness. And so for those out there who practice things like meditation and yoga and, um, and those types of things, or go, maybe reading before bed, reading scripture, prayer, things of that nature, things that would have a tendency to calm you down are all going to be very, very helpful for people who have a hard time falling asleep. If you don't have a hard time falling asleep, but you wake up at 2.37 every day, it's so funny because so many of my patients have one particular time that they have a tendency to wake up. That oftentimes has to do with your internal biological rhythm or your circadian rhythm. So to take one small step backwards, I want to explain to everybody how sleep actually works and why we see these sleep, sleep initiation or these circadian rhythm issues. So sleep is actually made up of two distinct systems in the brain. One is just like hunger, right? And so if you think about it, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I eat something and that hunger dissipates. The same holds true for sleep. Is, uh, there's a buildup of something called adenosine in your brain and as that builds up, you tend to get sleepier and sleepier and sleepier. That's one process. That's the sleep initiation component. However, there's also the circadian rhythm or your internal biological clock, and that's one that tells you when to go to sleep. So if your initiation component is off, then you have sleep initiation problems. If your biological clock component is off, then you have a tendency to wake up multiple times throughout the night. Does that make sense? Yes, it does, definitely, and I was kind of smiling when you said that because I like that word initiation stage. Um, something I learned that was really uh, very insightful for me, I was always waiting to fall asleep, I mean, to feel sleepy. Right. But I never felt sleepy. I seemed to be like the Energizer Bunny <laughs> late at night. Suddenly, I have even more energy than ever, and I want to keep getting all that work done that I didn't quite get to during the day. So that's bad because I'm looking at the computer screen and then once I get into bed, it's hours before I can fall asleep. So this was really a bad cycle. I knew I had to break it. But once I learned that one of the, the very, very first stage of sleep is that you get into bed and you lie there and then you start to calm down. So I realized then that I had to actually get ready for bed, kind of go through the routine and right. slip into my lovely, comfortable pajamas and mm -hmm. get into bed and lie there to begin to feel sleepy, that it wasn't just going to, you know, suddenly come upon me. I had to get into bed and start to wind down to tell my body that it was like time to go to sleep. I think people have a problem with that. I mean, do you? I absolutely. Yeah, I absolutely think that is the case, especially people who are taking an over-the-counter sleep aid, a prescription sleep aid, or even a nutraceutical. A lot of people think that they are supposed to feel sleepy, exactly as you described, and that that is the signal of when they're supposed to go to bed. So it turns out that it takes the human body approximately 15 to 20 minutes to actually enter into a state of unconsciousness. So it turns out that sleep is not an on-off switch. It's more like slowly pulling your foot off the gas and slowly putting your foot on the brake. There's a process that occurs there, and it takes approximately 15 to 20 minutes for that to occur. That process is not going to occur while you're standing up, walking around, brushing your teeth, um, you know, doing other things other than lying down. As it also turns out that when you lie down, your body immediately slows down your heart rate. So this is an internal mechanism that's working to help you fall asleep for sure. So by having your routine, which I love the fact that you have a routine, that's a really good sign, um, and lying in bed and spending a good 15 or 20 minutes just relaxing and allowing your body to start to slow down, that's when you will enter into sleep. And that's one of the reasons why so many people have a sleep initiation problem is because there's a lack of consistency. Um, they're not going to bed at the same time every night, which turns out to be the number one thing. If you get anything from our talk today, and I know there's a lot of more information on the summit, but if you get anything from our talk today, it's to go to bed at the same time and most importantly, to wake up 
at the same time. Our internal biological clock actually needs a, a very, very strict level of consistency. And that wake up time when light uh, comes into the eye and uh, bump, hits the optic nerve and bumps around in your brain and tells you it's time to wake up, that is a circadian Zeitgeber which is a fancy word for signal to the brain that, hey, it's time for morning and it's time to wake up. The more consistent we are at going to bed and waking up, the more in tune our system is. And quite frankly, the more our brain knows when to sleep. Well, we don't want to give away all the secrets at the summit, <laughs> but that was an important tip. And even if you hear that 50 times, we need to hear that, I think, you know, to, yeah. to really sink in. Because that's very important. Now, would you back up just a little bit and talk uh, about adenosine? Because I heard you say something about adenosine, if you don't mind repeating that again. Because what I know about adenosine is that it is part of the ATP uh, energy cycle in the body, where we get our energy. That's and correct. I also know that, uh, well, could you just explain to people a little bit about adenosine? Because you use that term, and I just wanted to yeah, you know, dwell on that a little longer. No, of, of course. So one of the things we know about adenosine is that it is a cellular byproduct. So once a cell um, gets some glucose uh, and is using it appropriately, something kind of basically comes out the back end. And one of those things happens to be adenosine. And we know that adenosine, once it builds up in the brain, causes sleepiness. Now, here's an interesting little fact, Donna. Most people don't know this, but if you look at the molecular structure of adenosine and you look at the molecular structure of caffeine, they're literally one molecule off. I was so glad you said that. I, I was thinking the same thing. I, one of the things I know about caffeine is that it, one of the, the reason it works, and because mm -hmm. adenosine is causing us to be sleepy, and caffeine stops that process. Exactly. And what's fascinating is, uh, is um, caffeine actually fits into um, adenosine receptor sites and oh. blocks the adenosine from going in and making us feel sleepy. So caffeine doesn't replace sleep. That you know, A lot of people think, well, I'll just get more energy from caffeine and I don't have to worry. Oh, no, 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 no. You cannot fool Mother Nature. Um, your body requires a certain amount of sleep um, and a lot of that is based on your adenosine. And all caffeine is doing is blocking it. When that caffeine gets eaten up and metabolized, then guess what? There's a rush of adenosine that comes in, and that's where that caffeine crash that so many people experience comes from. And if you don't sleep because of the caffeine, you're impeding uh, learning. Like you don't mem Absolutely. remember things. You don't learn what you learned. <laughs> Can you talk about that a little bit? Like of course. And so you know, there's a lot of interesting things that we know about sleep now. And um, one of the most important ones is that REM sleep, that stage where you have a tendency to dream and your eyes move back and forth, that is a, um, a stage of sleep where we move information from our short-term memory to our long-term memory. Uh, and the reason that's important is because once it gets stored in our long-term memory, it has to get into some, sort of an organizational structure that we can retrieve information from to be able to make good decisions. Um, and also, once it gets into our long-term memory is when we actually learn and we kind of put those dots together and bring the picture together in a much better way. So what we continue to learn about REM sleep is that there are several things out there that can affect it, like caffeine and alcohol and lack of consistent sleep time. So if you want to learn more, get good sleep. Hmm. What about people that put headphones on at night and fall asleep listening to a lecture? And I've read research that they actually are retaining that information. Do you think they are? I think that there's a possibility that they could be. My concern is, is when people fall asleep with headphones or earbuds in that they could do damage to their ear canal. So what I oftentimes ask my patients to do is to just go over to Radio Shack and you can actually pick up a pillow speaker. These are little speakers that can be attached to your, you know, MP3 player, I, uh, iPhone, uh, whatever musical device that you're playing that your lectures on, and the speaker is actually inside your pillow, so it can't do any damage to your ear canal, and um, you can listen and enjoy it. And it has a timer, so you can turn it turn it off when you want to. Absolutely. Oh, great! That's a good tip. Now I know nutrition is really important. Mm -hmm. B six is very important, and you've got to have lysine to get B six into the cells. Right. And I'm finding people today when I do look at their spectra cell tests that um, there's a lot of people deficient in vitamin A, which I think is mm -hmm. interesting too because you know you think of vitamin A and night blindness, like if you're deficient. Mm -hmm. So, you know, vitamin A has this 
really important um, effect on, on light. And some of us are super sensitive to light and some of us are uh, I know, I know some people, if you put blackout shades on the curtain and then blackout curtains on top of that and put a sleep mask on them, then they can sleep. Wow. With the tiniest bit of light in the room, you know, they can't sleep anymore. So um, could you just say just a few words about the light, you know, how mm-hmm. light is affecting our sleep? Sure. So what we now know, um, is that there are certain cells in your eyeball called melanopsin cells. And when a very particular wavelength of light, approximately 460 nanometers, or what we call blue light, you may have heard of that in, uh, in articles that you've read on the internet or in interviews that you've heard people do, um, that specific wavelength affects those cells. And those cells send an electrical signal to the brain saying, hey, turn off the melatonin, it's morning. And so this is one of the reasons why we have to be very, very careful about light exposure late in the evening. And that light exposure can be anything from a handheld device like your phone uh, or a tablet to laptop uh, computers. And so it's not surprising when we hear about people who have specifically light sensitivities also having difficulty sleeping because we know that light, in fact, prevents melatonin from being produced. And while melatonin isn't the only thing that you need for sleep, it's kind of the key that starts the engine. Do you mind if I read a few of these questions from Facebook? No, let's go ahead. Okay, great. Okay, here's the first one. Okay. My 21-year-old daughter has a lot of trouble falling asleep. Once sleep, she will sleep for about six to seven hours, but she feels tired. What are the possible causes? So the first thing I look at in a case like this is um, the consistency of their sleep schedule, number one. Number two, I look at how much caffeine this person might be taking in and at what times they're taking it in, number two. Um, Number three, I look at alcohol. Since she is 21, she may have alcohol on board, which could be, um, while making you feel sleepy, could actually prevent you from being able to get into deeper stages of sleep. Um, And I look at exercise. One of the easiest ways to improve the quality of your sleep is for for you to get daily exercise. And then, of course, I would start to look at things like diet. Um, I don't need to tell you, Donna, you know the importance of diet in our overall level of health and, of course, within our sleep. Yes, great. And then um, uh, she may be, as a 21-year-old, also... You know, having all kinds of gadgets in her bedroom. Maybe her sure. phone's in there with her. Maybe Absolutely. she's got a TV set in there, little blinking lights on her clock. So that might be another thing too. I've been really fascinated lately with genes for the last couple of years. And uh, there are a lot of issues with genes. Like, you know, a, a surprising number of people have a gene called, or have a bunch, of, well, there's more than one gene variant for GAD. So you can't convert GABA, uh, glutamate into GABA and go, mm. and then you need GABA to quiet down and yeah. you know reduce anxiety. And then another gene I found and kind of fascinated with is called AANAT. So that one prevents melaton- uh, serotonin from converting into melatonin. So I do think genes are playing a role in um, us not sleeping well, but then of course there's always you know, those gene, we control those genes, so it really it does get back to everything you just said. Yeah, absolutely. That's I, There's definitely some fascinating genetic work that's out there. It hasn't been an area of study for me yet, um, but I will tell you that after the summit, I learned so much from all of my speakers, yourself included, um, that I've definitely got some new research interests now and some things that I'm thinking about trying to understand better so I can help my patients more. Okay, here's another question. It's a good one involving a little girl. She says, my two-year-old wakes up multiple times in the night and very early in the morning, regardless of what time she goes to bed. She's not getting enough sleep, but I'm not sure what to do about it. So what are some of the first things that pop into your mind for a child, a two-year-old? Sure. So when children are having a difficulty uh, falling asleep, but more importantly, staying asleep, one of the first things I want to check out is could they have something called sleep apnea? Um, This is a situation where they stop breathing in their sleep. It's very, very difficult for parents to tell. The best thing to do is to have a sleep study performed. Um, But usually sleep children, once they fall asleep, it's very um, rare to have them wake up. So if your child is snoring um, or if your child has multiple awakenings throughout the evening, one of the first things I I would tell parents to do is talk with your pediatrician about the possibility that they could have sleep apnea. 
Also, for many of the people out there, we had two different pediatricians, sleep expert pediatricians, um, give lectures. One for infants, so um, below age one, and then one for toddlers and uh, preschoolers after that. And we also had quite a bit of discussion about teenagers and how teenagers sleep. So if that's an issue for you in your household, definitely check out the summit. I think a lot of people are going to go to the summit just for that lecture. Do you mind <laughs> giving us the name of you know, who those sure. pediatricians were? Uh, it was uh, Dr. Alan Green uh, and Dr. Carrie Cornis. Um, and they're both on the same day. Uh, I think it's day four. I'm not positive. People can check the schedule. But both of them, they're the only two pediatricians that I have. And they're both talking about uh, pediatric sleep issues. Great. Well, I've done a lot of, um, you know, of course, I work with children with autism. And whenever I can, and their parents have, you know, have their genes tested, I'll look at that. And there's a lot of children that have um, a gene called MAO-A. Adults have it too, of course. And that particular gene tends to uh, make it difficult for you to degrade the serotonin. So they end up with too much serotonin. I know people always think of serotonin as being, you know, the precursor to melatonin. So you would think, well, the more the better, you know, but can you just say a little bit about serotonin? Um, sure. Because I'm always, I'm trying to get more information on this. And unfortunately, there's not enough out there. But if you can't degrade the serotonin very efficiently, it tends to stay high, but at the same time, it's not getting into the cells. Right. And so there's a couple of things that can occur during that situation. One is something called serotonin syndrome, uh, which can actually be where there's an overproduction of serotonin or a lack of De degradation of said serotonin, and that can have some pretty far-reaching um, side effects and implications. Um, but on the sleep side of things, the reason that we're so concerned about the proper uh, metabolism of serotonin is because it does lead to melatonin. And remember, melatonin is sort of that key that starts the engine for sleep. And so you need to have that, and you need to have your serotonin functions working well in order to sleep well. Mm-hmm. And so another thing, too, is for staying asleep, um, glucose, um, regulating mm -hmm. your blood sugar. I know that when glucose falls, insulin falls as well, and then you're going to start releasing a lot of cortisol, and that right. certainly would wake you up. And, and I've had that a number of times when I'm stressed out and have too much on my plate, and sure. I'll wake up too early, and I can feel my heart just racing away like crazy. So... Mm -hmm. uh, do you cover that in the summit too? As a matter of fact, we do. We talked with Dr. Michael Murray and almost his entire talk surrounded uh, blood sugar, uh, glucose, and the how to be able to know when your glucose is too high and talk about testing methodology to understand how to sleep better by monitoring your overall level of blood sugar. So actually, we did, we did cover that one. Great. Um, if I could slip this information in, um, you know, because a lot of people are today saying that carbohydrates aren't good for you. And as far as, you know, in our diet, in the Body Ecology diet, I recommend that people have a vegetarian dinner with some carbohydrate in it. And, and the carbohydrates, you know, how much a person needs varies from person to person. Some people will do better on more. If I don't eat carbohydrates for several days, because let's say I'm traveling and I can't get them healthy ones out, um, I do stop sleeping. I'm a blood type A, and I've observed mm -hmm. for many, many years that this is very common in blood type A. So I, I make a point of eating carbs. Now, if somebody's a real, is doing really super well on a high-protein, more paleo-type diet, they would probably disagree with me, but we're all in different kind of bodies. So what I do know from years of working with people is that if you eat complex carbohydrates for an evening meal, um, then you're going to make more serotonin and therefore melatonin and on body ecology because so many people have systemic yeast infections we don't eat rice or oats never gluten but um the <clears throat> hold on a second but instead we eat quinoa and millet they have to be cooked properly to get rid of the oxalates so we boil them like we're boiling spaghetti noodles and then we pour off the water uh, to you know, get rid of the oxalates, you boil them, you boil the quinoa for about 11 minutes in water and then pour all that water off. Millet is about 15 minutes, you pour all that water off. And then uh, then that's great for, for people who have stage one uh, on the diet that are you know, have candidiasis. But then I want people to move into red rice, black rice, GABA rice, because GABA rice is 
a strain of rice developed by the Japanese that's super rich in GABA, and that helps tremendously fall asleep. Hmm. And then I haven't whole, heard of that one. That's interesting. Oh, yeah, it's I, a great one, yeah. I know there's a lot of data to show that carbohydrates within 90 minutes of bedtime, like just like if you've had carbohydrates and then stop and give yourself about 90 minutes, it actually can be quite helpful for people to fall asleep. So I'm a carbohydrate fan myself. Oh, good. And then oat groats. I like for people to eat the whole oat groat um, because, you you know, oatmeal is dirty. They just bring it in and slice it up and stick it in a box for you. But if you can get the oat groats, uh, you can wash them off and they're much cleaner and soak them. I think it's really important to soak the grains, but you've got to digest them. It's not just eating them. I think one of the reasons people are so anti-carbs is they don't know, they're not digesting them. Uh, they can use enzymes, and then we always have a few spoonfuls of fermented vegetables in one of our meals, so they're going to be loaded with bacteria that will help digest that carb. You know, how you cook them is really important. A small quantity, like we have this rule in body ecology called the 80-20 rule. So 20% of what's on your plate might be um, the gaba rice or the quinoa, and 80% would be a lot of veggies. So the, that's why I think people... I, mean, I think people are anti-carbs because they don't understand how to prepare them or you know, they're eating too many of them or whatever, but I, I'm so glad you agree with me on that. Oh, yeah. Carbohydrates can definitely help people sleep better, that's for sure. Um, and we actually had an entire uh, lecture looking at food and sleep, aside from the one that you and I talked about. Uh, we had uh, a gentleman who was talking about how not all calories are created equal and the relationship between the metabolic process and sleep deprivation. So the more sleep deprived you are, the less able your body is to digest uh, mm -hmm. appropriately and so food has a tendency to turn to fat uh, very difficult to lose weight when you're not sleeping well things like that so it definitely sounds like we're, we're on the same page yeah definitely and you know I found a study many years ago it was fascinating to me when I read this that um, well the, the researchers were looking at children in Africa and they had they were protein malnourished and because of that they had very high levels of cortisol so that spoke to me right then and there that if you're protein malnourished, your cortisol is going to be higher, and that's going to keep you from sleeping too. So nutrition really is playing a very important role. Yeah, oh, sleep. absolutely. No question about it. Well, I know you know that, but I just wanted to be sure to say that to our listeners mm -hmm. here, for sure. So just to hang out for a little longer on this topic of nutrition, gluten, because somebody said in one of the comments that they made on Facebook, is this is Angela, and she said, Anytime I get exposed to gluten, it always interferes with sleep, followed by a night of tossing and turning and waking up unrested. And she wasn't sure that was, you know, why? Why is this happening? Uh, what would you, do you have people talking about that in the summit? We actually do have some people who are talking specifically about gluten. While gluten isn't an area of research that I've done a whole lot of work on, my limited understanding is is that when you introduce gluten into a system that isn't used to having gluten uh, at uh, varying amounts um, and and fairly often your body can in fact have a pretty pretty big reaction to that gluten and uh, it's that reaction oftentimes that's keeping people out of the deeper stages of sleep mm -hmm. and just to add to that gluten is very inflammatory yes. there's a it's very inflammatory in the gut and there's this very important gut brain connection so there's a ton of research on how gluten causes havoc with the immune system. They call it um, immune dysregulation, but that actually causes the cortex of the brain to become overly excited, and then then the person's not going to sleep. And there, there's just tons of research on the gut-brain connection and all kinds of, you know, anxiety, depression, even cognitive impairment, headaches, uh, schizophrenia. All those things are connected to eating gluten. So. All anxiety, someone who has anxiety or they're depressed, they're not going to sleep as well. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. I think you're, I think we're, we definitely know that there is, you know, your gut is your second brain. And we know that actually, believe it or not, almost 60% of your melatonin is produced in your gut. So we know there's a connection. While we don't know exactly how that connection works just yet, we did have um, a speaker talk on the um, microbiome and how it the sleep and the microbiome interact as well. So for people out there who have an interest in understanding that better, we've got you covered there as well. Great. Well, there's uh, Angela's answer right there. So perfect. Obviously, everybody has got to listen to the summit. How about devices? I know that there are quite a lot of devices coming out on the market these days to help people sleep better. Do you cover that at all? 
We do. We talk about monitoring devices. Um, Dan Party and I, who is also another sleep expert, talked quite a bit about light, light boxes, different uh, monitors and trackers that are out there. So that's also covered. Um, we even talk in some cases about mattresses and pillows. So there's a whole bunch of different things that we're, we're talking about because, you know, sleep fundamentally is affected by your environment. And so knowing and understanding your environment is going to be a really important way uh, to get a better night's rest. So, Michael, you've really covered all the bases. Do you mind just telling people a little bit more about yourself, like your, how sure. you got into this, why you decided to do this summit, and some of the amazing things that you've done? Oh, sure. On TV, for example. Yeah, absolutely. So, I, you know, it's, I've been very fortunate. Um, I've been a practicing sleep specialist for the last 16 years. And um, some of you may have actually seen me on the Dr. Oz show. I am the Dr. Oz sleep doctor. I've been on the show over 30 times in the past seven seasons. And, um, you know, what's been great about that is the opportunity to educate people in all walks of life about sleep. And that was part of the reason why I wanted to do this summit is I know that people who listen to summits are very interested in their health. Um, they're actively participating in their health in, in ways that many, unfortunately, people out there are not. And so my, doing a summit, oddly enough, there had never been a sleep summit before, at least not to my knowledge. Um, doing a summit was allowing me to really take a deep dive into many different areas um, and be able to expose people to lots of different potential treatments for all of their sleep issues. So it turned out to just be a great event for me. Um, personally, I learned so much, uh, more than I ever expected to learn. I thought I knew everything there was to know about sleep, and I was, <laughs> I was rudely awakened to the fact that I did not. But it was great to learn from all of these wonderful experts uh, and to have that opportunity now to pass that information on to the Summit listeners and eventually to be able to get this information out uh, to other audiences as well. Well, thank you very much for putting this summit together. I personally know how much work that is. Yeah. I also know that this is one of the most important summits anyone will ever listen to. So thank you for being on this little talk with me today so we can encourage people to sign up on the link in this newsletter. Thank you, Donna. I am so excited to have the opportunity to talk um, with you and with all of the people that follow your wonderful advice. I happen to be one of those people as well. Uh, and I can't tell you what an honor it is to be able to talk with everybody about sleep. Thank you.